Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about example related to the tension test. or tensile testing. We could equivalently be talking about the compression test or compressive testing, but we're going to look at the tensile test as an example. So normally we have a specimen, and specimen can be typically as a flat specimen or a round specimen with a machined section, which is called a gauge section, which is the regime over which we focus on the deformation that's taking place. So normally we have a specimen something like this that's mounted in grips so these grips may clamp it or the uh, if it's a round section it may actually be threaded it may actually be threaded into the grips and within this length of including the grips we can set up a tension or compression by actually translating this crosshead which is connected and this is supposed to show threads coming down here. So this crosshead can move up or down. If the crosshead moves up, it's going to pull on the sample, right, at the same time that it actually applies a load onto its threads. It's going to pull onto the sample. And if in series we have what's called a load cell, something that measures its displacement in a calibrated way so that we can actually get the load or the force being applied within this, um, within this series of elements that are under under force, we can find the actual load that's being applied through this entire stream or this entire series of, of elements such that it must be applied also to the specimen since the cross-sectional area of the specimen is the smallest in the gauge section. That's the place at which we expect to see the most stress. Often an extensometer is used. It can be an extensometer that measures the change in length or it can be one that measures the change in diameter. Obviously, measuring the, the change in length it involves more sensitivity, but we can have either one. It can be a, 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 a diameter gauge or an extension gauge, and that gauge allows us to directly measure the displacement within this area. Otherwise, there's going to be displacement from elastic distortion, bending of the crosshead, and these that we'd have to account for or actually subtract for in order to verify what's taking place. So when we look at an individual sample or a characteristic and we're talking about a, a, a individual set of tension experiments, usually we're focused on what's taking place just inside the gauge section. And we can see that in the next figure. I'm just gonna draw a gauge section in the next figure. And we'll pull out an element here. So this is just the gauge section. Right? And we could be applying a tensile stress to it, something like that. So we would have a, a, a tensile stress. If we define a set of axes, in this case I'm going to define a set of axes as x and y and z. If we defined our set of axes this way, we could have our stress be described as a tensor wherein all of the terms are zero except for one. And this can be increased or will increase as we try and pull this further and further. Okay, so in this case we have a set of forces applied in the y direction on the face perpendicular to the y axis. So we have sigma 2, 2 which often can also be described as sigma y as being equal to whatever the applied force is divided by the area. If we do it as an engineering, we can take this where this is the initial cross-sectional area, a sub naught. Okay? Now when we do that and we extend it, we also expect there to be a corresponding strain Okay, we expect there to be a corresponding strain, and we may describe the, the strain as follows. If we assume that the material is essentially uniform and isotropic, we expect that there would be an increase in length. So we expect a strain also in the y direction, and we would expect that strain to be positive. Okay, so we call that E sub y. 
I'm going to have an e sub x and an e sub z, right? That we expect a strain in this direction and a strain in this direction. And that strain we expect to actually be negative because as we pull on it and make it any length, we actually expect this cross-sectional area to decrease, which means that there should be a strain in the z direction and also one in the, in the x direction. And for this particular geometry, and if we assume that the material has uniform properties, probably don't expect any other strains if everything is perfectly aligned. So we don't expect any shear strain. So for the example that we've shown here, if sigma naught is greater than zero, then we expect the strain in the y direction to also be greater than zero, and we expect the strain in the x and the z directions to be less than zero. Okay? So we'll focus on this strain right, and this stress and look at what we expect to have happen, and we're going to describe this in, by plotting the stress versus the strain. We're just going to look at a piece of a stress-strain curve. We're going to look at the, the piece along which we expect the material to behave in an elastic fashion. So what I have plotted here on the y-axis is stress, in this case given an MPA, and strain, recognizing that strain is dimensionless, okay, with, with numbers along the axes. And this gives a comparison of the initial behavior for a number of different materials, some unreinforced, that is, polymers without reinforcements put inside of them, or non-composite materials, aluminum, brass, steel, the ceramic silicon carbide. I'd plot this as linear. In fact, this is an assumption of not only isotropic, but isotropic, essentially linear elasticity. And most materials are nearly linear at this point, describing what Hooke discovered, as in terms of Hooke's law, that at least as we initially load a material before it starts to permanently deform, we expect the material to demonstrate elasticity. If it demonstrates elasticity, the ratio of the stress to the strain gives us essentially a constant, right? For aluminum, it would be the ratio of the stress to the strain gives us a constant, and that constant is named for Young, Thomas Young, and it's Young's modulus. Make sure that the U is visible there. Okay? I also described for the elastic loading of the material that in addition to a lengthening, we also expect the transverse strain, in this case the strain that was initially in the, uh, in the X and in the Z directions on the prior slide, the transverse strains related to the axial strain, so this would be, in our case, could be EX over EY, that the inverse of that gives a ratio, a quantity, right, which is called Poisson's ratio. Name for the mathematician Poisson. Okay, and that is also a constant. So this is one of the so-called elastic constants for a material, and this is another. Constant, of course, assuming that the net pressure and the temperature do not change. So two of the elastic constants. In fact, we can use these two elastic constants to describe Hooke's law for a multidimensional set of stresses. So stresses applied in multiple directions at the same time, assuming that we have, as shown in the, in the next slide, a particular set of stresses. So assuming we have this case of stress. So we have a stress state sigma x where the terms in the shear positions are all equal to zero. This is in fact called a principal stress state. The principal values being essentially related to the eigenvalues of the tensor expressed as a matrix. So when we have this particular situation where the stresses are only along the diagonal, whatever their magnitudes are, we can use this particular form for Hooke's Law, 
that allows us to use just the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio from this set of applied stresses to get the corresponding set of strains. And in this case, because we only have strains also along the diagonal, we will have the principal strains. So if we have principal stresses, we can get the principal strains assuming that the material is elastic such that we can use the elastic constants. Okay, so 